Hello and welcome to the Wednesday, May 16th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Remember how yesterday I talked about how Adobe released a PDF Reader and Acrobat update kind of surprisingly on Friday, just a couple days after the usual patch Tuesday. Well, it turns out that there is now working exploit code public that does affect vulnerabilities being patched by this update, as well as vulnerabilities patched by Microsoft on Patch Tuesday. The two vulnerabilities are first of all CVE 2018-4990. This is a code execution vulnerability in Acrobat Reader. And secondly, CVE 2018-8120. What apparently happened was that antivirus company ESET noticed that two PDFs were uploaded to VirusTotal that actually triggered these vulnerabilities. Not clear if the actual discoverer of the vulnerabilities did upload the files or if a victim inadvertently uploaded the files to VirusTotal. Given that information about this vulnerability is now public and it wouldn't be all that hard for anybody now to create a PDF exploiting the code execution as well as the approach escalation exploit, you should really be very careful about PDFs in the near future and make sure that you expedite applying the patch from last Friday. And I just checked one of the samples on VirusTotal and according to VirusTotal, I just triggered a rescan. Only four out of 58 antivirus engines are detecting these known samples. And then we got an interesting vulnerability that was disclosed in the Keeper Password Manager API. Keeper is one of these password managers that you can use to save your passwords in a wallet. And like many of these tools, it does provide the ability to sync passwords across different devices. Now, whenever you have an architecture like this, you avoid sending clear text passwords to this central repository. Instead, you encrypt passwords on the device and then only send an encrypted file to the device. Now, in addition, you also need to authenticate to the server so you can update your data and retrieve your data. And this is really where the problem comes in. You're using the same password to authenticate to the server as you use to derive the encryption key. So you're using the same passphrase to encrypt the data as you use to authenticate to the server. Now, this is actually somewhat common, but you're not sending the passphrase to the server. Instead, you're deriving an authentication hash. The way you do this is that you first connect to the server, you provide your username. In return, you're receiving a nonce, and then it will tell you what hashing function to use, which is the PBKDS two function, which is uh, very common for uh, this procedure. Now you create that hash, you send it to the server. Then in order to create the decryption key for your passwords, you're using again your password, you're using again the password based key derivation function two or PBKDF2, but you're using a different nonce. But the problem comes in here is that the API server provided the nonce that you're using to create the hash that you're using to log in. So if someone has control of the API server, and again, this is the threat model here, this is why we are not sending clear text passwords to the API server, they could send you a nonce that's identical to the nonce that you're using to derive the decryption key. With that, this malicious server would then have the decryption key that's needed to decrypt your passwords. So rather be straightforward to exploit once you get a hold of the API server, Probably the quick fix here would be to also provide a client nonce as part of the login and then make sure that the nonce being used to create that login hash never matches the nonce being used to create the decryption key. Would probably also be best to use different hashing algorithms 
Now, a different number of iterations certainly wouldn't be the fix here, in particular if you're sending less iterations to the authentication server, because they could always then apply additional iterations of the hashing functions to then again arrive at the decryption key. Now, two caveats about this vulnerability. The person that found the vulnerability is not working for Keeper, so they didn't have a chance to actually test this using the Keeper API server. They don't have access to it. They just used uh, the API in order to basically see this design flaw. They also have not gotten any response from Keeper regarding the flaw. They originally notified according to the timeline Keeper on January 9th, made a number of additional attempts since then, but uh, well, never got a response or even had email bounce. But well, this wouldn't be a complete podcast if we wouldn't talk about some kind of cryptocurrency scam. Brad found a sort of interesting phishing attempt for myetherwallet.org. What's interesting kind of about it is that they came up with a pretty good lookalike domain name, myetherwallet.org. A.org. So they just added the letter A to the domain name. And of course, that's not easily spotted if you're clicking on the link. Actually, in some ways, they made it sort of worse by making the link read myetherwallet.com. So some email clients like Thunderbird is what Brad used here in his demo do alert you if the link that you're clicking on doesn't reflect the text that you're clicking on. Of course, if you do actually click, you end up on the myetherwalleta.org page, which then emulates the legitimate myetherwallet page and steals your password. That's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.